And so I think as we're still, people are still coming in, um, I will begin this second of our forum events, the Spotlight on the Arts, and I'll say a few words about the focus of today and why we are hosting it. Are we? Um, I, think, I think in essence, it's really quite simple. Um, the, hang on, where are we? Um, I think it's time to recognise that the experience of creativity in others and in ourselves can make a profound contribution to the health and well-being of individuals and of communities. I firmly believe that creativity is at the heart of what makes us human and what makes our ability to translate experience into something meaningful. And there are thousands of studies that underpin this proposition. The all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being report, Creative Health, is the most comprehensive publication to date. It documents over a thousand published studies that outline the role of arts and creativity in supporting health across the course of a person's life. And here in Wales, we're lucky. The Memorandum of Understanding between the Arts Council of Wales and the Welsh NHS Confederation has shown the growing recognition of that reality. One good step forward has been funding support for all health boards in Wales to engage on arts and health coordinator. Funds have also been given to programmes such as Katrevi, which is a programme with Age Cymru and the Bering Foundation, supporting creative approaches to care through artists and residents within care homes. I think it's clear that we have some fantastic examples in Wales that demonstrate how access to the arts and opportunities and participation in the arts can dramatically improve our health outcomes and well-being, counter inequalities and increase social engagement. Our presentations today are a real testament to this fact. So on a political level, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act has defined one of its seven national goals as a vibrant culture. And in this realm, culture means of the arts, music, literature, heritage, all those creative activities that give people purpose, a sense of belonging and identity. Arts and culture are therefore central to society and to a sense of nationhood. And in terms of the wider agenda, the government paper, Light Springs Through the Dark, a vision for culture in Wales, outlines the growing recognition of the value to the economy of arts and culture and the vital contribution that they can make in the effective delivery of other areas of public policy. In turning to the evidence, research tells us that the benefits of the arts can be profound. Key findings show arts-based programmes can reduce stress and anxiety, help those suffering from painful treatments, and that art and culture can be used directly to improve clinical outcomes. Whilst the evidence has steadily grown, some activities are more readily evaluated for their effectiveness than others. The great diversity of approaches, dancing, singing, writing, mosaics, collage, knitting, and I could go on, means there is inevitably stronger evidence for some things than for others. And the quality and robustness of that evidence varies. I think also the question of whether, say, singing in a choir with 40 people on a Thursday night with a cup of tea and a digestive is beneficial for treating ill health or maintaining good health is not always easy to answer in simple terms. And I think at, at this stage where we are now, we're beginning to emerge from a long winter and the COVID-19 pandemic has starkly exposed the challenges endemic in our society. It's emphasized concerns around mental health, reinforced inequalities and has in many ways exasperated them, making addressing these issues all the more urgent and lack of access to cultural and creative opportunities all too often mirrors other inequalities. However, opportunities to learn and reshape things have appeared. And in these extraordinary times, people and communities have been turning to creative activities as an important source of enjoyment, connection, solace and meaning throughout the COVID-19 crisis. And evidence shows that these activities have begun in small ways to address some of the worrying trends in mental health and of social and health inequality. But this recognition and this practice are still patchy, fragile, and in many places still seen as marginal. In his address at the launch of the National Centre for Creative Health earlier this year, the chair of the NHS Confederation, Victor Adebowali, outlined the three things he felt really mattered when considering the future of the health and social care system. Being here today, as we are, to look at art, health and well-being, 
I think they're worth repeating. The first is equity of lived experience. An example are the statistics for healthy life expectancy in women in Wales. In Blaen I Gwent, it's 59 years old, and in Monmouthshire, it's 71 years old. And this is a shocking figure, and it should be at the root of many of our discussions. The second thing is access. So it's about how services, activities, interventions are designed, about commissioning, about the need to understand an individual and a community. And the third priority is digital and should support the first two things, equity and access. And in the years ahead, digital working will bring about major changes to health and social care at integrated system level, at place, at neighbourhood, and has the potential to be a serious influence on, public, on population health. Um, a recent paper by NHS Wales on digital technology and health inequalities clearly acknowledges the concern that whilst the system can inadvertently widen health inequalities and should be taken seriously, this should not mean abandoning a digitised health system, but should instead have inclusion right at the heart. To conclude, it's clear that working co-productively with communities and with people who use services is crucial, and that creating culturally specific activities are key to challenging inequalities in health and in the arts and culture. There are so many powerful opportunities to address both clinical and social determinants of health. And I think it's also not to forget that arts and culture are also enjoyable and fun activities and can be a real tonic when they're least expected. So, our hope is that by coming together today, we can drive forward some of these important conversations and further recognise that arts and culture make considerable and necessary contributions to the well-being of individuals and communities. Thank you for coming today and welcome to those who've arrived a little later. Um, it's going to be a great morning. I'm now going to introduce my colleague with Together for Change, Maria Jones, who is going to be talking about the Solver Care Mosaic Art Project. Maria, over to you. Okay, thank you, Jesse. What a comprehensive and thought-provoking introduction. Thank you so much. So, hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, my name is Maria Jones, and as Jesse said, I'm the Programme Coordinator for Together for Change. And in a former life, I worked as research officer for Solver Care, a small charity in the village of Solver in Pembrokeshire. So I'm just going to share my screen there. So the project I'd like to talk to you about today was known fondly locally as the Great Solver Mosaic Steps Project. It was then, and has continued to grow, a body of evidence that engaging in the arts can improve people's health and well-being. Based on this evidence, Solver Care set up a community mosaic arts project that involved members of the community learning how to create mosaics and putting the skills that they learned to use by producing mosaics to decorate a set of unattractive village sets. The Allen Lane Foundation funded the mosaics with local fundraising paying for the handrails and Pembrokeshire County Council for the resurfacing of the steps. So let me just show you what they looked like before. So as you can see, not, not great. So, the project aimed to demonstrate well-being outcomes amongst participants from the community who were involved in producing the mosaics and these were to bring the generations together in an enjoyable and productive social activity, to enhance the well-being of participants, happiness, confidence, creativity and enjoyment, to improve the participants sense of creativity, interest in the arts and other community activities, to develop existing skills and learn new skills, and to extend the participants' social connections and connectivity. The intended physical outcome of the project was to decorate the sets with mosaics and make them safer. So following the launch of the pro project in October 2017, 12 mosaic making sessions were held in the village's memorial hall over a period of six weeks and were led by artists Maddie James and Penny Davon. They tutored the participants in techniques and designed the overall layouts of the final panels. All the sessions were free and the tutors were paid and provided the materials. Participants could attend either an afternoon session or an evening session. On the evening of the final class, the completed panels were exhibited to the community in the local um, memorial hall. 
and then a follow-up next steps meeting to inform participants and those interested in future projects of the forthcoming installation phase of the project was held in the spring of 2018. The retiling of the steps, fixing of the new handrails and the installation by the artists took place in May, uh, in May of the, that year, followed by a launch event. And here you can see some of the detail of the completed steps and the finished product, which I'm sure you'll agree is visually stunning. So with that beautiful image on the screen, I'll explain briefly about the evaluation design. The evaluation was summative. It involved a survey of the participants of the art classes and observation of the following meetings. The evaluation was based on self-completed structured questionnaire developed by Solvacare's research monitoring and evaluation group and also comments recorded with participants in the next steps meeting where attendees were asked about their experience of the project and whether they were interested in future mosaic and community arts projects. A draft questionnaire was piloted by Solvacare's RME group and was based on one developed and used for the evaluation of a community project called Inclusion Through the Arts. The final version was distributed in paper format at the penultimate classes, collected at those or in the final classes. So let me show you some of the findings. There were a total of 29 participants in the project, of which 17 attended the afternoon sessions and 12 the evening. All were female with the exception of one male. No information on disabilities or language was recorded. They, the questionnaire, of the questionnaires, 18 were returned and the majority who recorded their age were between 60 and 70. In terms of participation, 39% of respondents had taken part in an arts project previously and with outcomes, they're scored on a scale of one to five with one being the lowest and five being the highest. And you can see there that there were high levels of satisfaction with 89% of respondents having gained high levels of enjoyment from the project. 66% of respondents had gained confidence from participating in the project. One lower score came from a person who said that the confident, that confidence had not been a problem for me. 83% of participants had gained a greater sense of creativity and 94% had gained an increased sense of happiness, had increased their skills, and it has enabled them to make new connections with people. 67% of respondents reported that the project had affected their interest in attending community activities, with a further 22% saying they were already interested. A majority of participants would like to be involved in more arts projects, with the remainder saying that they'd be interested depending on the subject and time uh, required. So participants were also encouraged to share their views or suggestions. So I'll just read a couple out. It's been a very happy and enjoyable experience. I've learned a new skill and met many new folks I didn't know before. I feel very proud of the finished steps because of my contribution. And another one, I found it difficult in every sense and have a long way to go before I will feel satisfied with my output. But I love the classes. The teachers were so helpful and encouraging. I met new people and it was refreshing to meet some younger ones who I'd never come across. It felt great doing something positive as part of the group for the community. Respondents were also invited to comment on their developed skills. Many commented on learning a new one and some commented on increases in dexterity and other practical abilities. Again, here are a couple. I've wanted to create mosaics in my garden after seeing them on holiday. Now I have the skills to take this forward. And um, cutting, making patterns, awareness of color, shape and space seem to prove, improve my dexterity surprisingly. At the end of the project, this evaluation evidenced positive outcomes for the participants, some of whom you can see here. Overall, it was a valuable experience for the majority of participants. They reported an improved sense of well-being. They had learned new skills or reinforced those that were already processed, possessed, sorry. 
new social connections across the ages were also facilitated. Practical skills had either been learnt or reinforced. Community links had also been strengthened for many people and a wide range of people participated. The response rate of the questionnaire was good and the follow-up meeting was well attended, showing a sustained level of interest in the project with new people attending. It is clear that the project contributed to the strengthening of the partnership between the community and the County Council, as the Council arranged and paid for the retiling of the steps, and the steps were officially opened by Cabinet Member Councillor Phil Baker, with the Council's press office leading on the publicity and providing a photographer. Small local businesses were also supported by the project and to engage artists and handrail manufacturers to deliver it. Uh, nevertheless, the evaluation did have certain shortcomings. For example, a pre-survey of participants was not carried out, nor was a follow-up survey to check if the reported outcomes were sustained. The questionnaire was also self-reporting and the response is not verified. However, we conclude that the Great Solver Mosaic Steps project was successful overall in meeting its objectives. The full evaluation report is in is on the Solver Care website and Amy will pop the link to that in the chat box. A year later, a series of workshops were held to create mosaics to enhance the buttresses and the planters of the local memorial hall, as you can see, and future, a future project to commemorate the losses caused by the pandemic is also at planning stage. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mia. That was a great presentation um, and wonderful to see something that was a, a kind of a good example of a partnership between a grassroots organisation and the local authority, but the, so the colour and beauty of it that clearly brought people together. Those photographs are really um, sort of captivating. So thank you so much. Um, and hopefully there'll be some opportunities for some questions um, after the next presentation. And I'm delighted to um, present Amanda Stone, um, who will be discussing her experiences of running the Writing for Wellbeing Group workshops um, over the last few months. Thank you, Amanda. Over to you. Thanks, Jesse, and also thank you, Maria. Yes, I'm Amanda Stone, and I'm a freelance charity consultant and psychotherapist, and I've lived in Solva for the last five years, previously uh, near Abergavenny for 12 years, so quite a long time in Wales now, but I don't speak Welsh yet. I'm active in my local community as both a volunteer and uh, last year set up St David's Connection, a community partnership focusing on community engagement in nature and arts projects. During the last lockdown, I offered to run an online writing for wellbeing group supported by Solver Care, as all over the UK, people were sharing their experiences of isolation, lack of social contact and low mood many of the reasons um, very succinctly explained by Jesse earlier. Writing for wellbeing workshops use freestyle writing and imaginative prompts to encourage people to feel more confident about writing and to engage in expressive and playful writing exercises. As I'm a practicing psychotherapist and writer, I know how enjoyable and uplifting self-expression in writing can be. However, this isn't a form of therapy, but like many group create, creative activities, it can help to improve well-being and social connection. Most people say this kind of reflective time for writing helps them to slow down, feel calmer, and step away from daily life. The opportunity to have the structure of weekly group time is also beneficial to some people who wouldn't otherwise make the time to write without this commitment. We promoted the workshops via local posters, the community newsletter and social media. We were aiming to have 12 people sign up for this pilot and commit to a series of four one hour workshops each week on Zoom in the early evening. We had a quick and positive response and 12 people started, although one soon had to drop out due to childcare needs. Obviously this was during lockdown. Each week, I presented a theme from nature or the landscape and shared poems and passages that reflected these themes. 
We also tried different writing exercises, including writing a letter to someone we admire. Someone chose Bruce Springsteen, creating haikus, writing as an animal, that was very interesting, and writing freestyle with image prompts. There is no element of writing criticism or teaching creative writing in the workshops. It's all about having the time and space to write with encouragement and without judgment or other limitations. No one has to share what they've written unless they want to, and there is no expectation to give feedback or comments. I trained in this technique with Lapidus International, the association that promotes writing for well-being, and they published research and guidelines about this way of working for their members. They've done quite a lot of research with the University of Chester, and I know someone uh, mentioned in the chat that they're an MA student there, so that's great. Um, and if you're interested, I certainly would urge you to look at the Lapidus um, website, which is very easy to access. As Jesse said, there's a lot of research about the benefits of creative practices for well-being. I don't really want to go over that, but I do think that the research commissioned by the BBC and University College London, which was called the Great British Creativity Test, which involved 50,000 people, did identify three main ways in which creativity can benefit us. And I think this is particularly relevant to writing for well-being. And these were, as a distraction, using creativity to avoid stress and anxiety, obviously particularly relevant during COVID lockdown. Also as contemplation, creativity is a tool to create space in the mind to reassess problems and make plans. And thirdly, as a means of self-development, building up confidence, self-esteem, problem solving and coping skills. Writing for wellbeing workshops are typically led by someone who has experience in running group workshops, in designing workshops, in facilitation, managing group dynamics and has training in safeguarding, maintaining confidentiality and boundaries. But most importantly, a writing for wellbeing practitioner has a passion for writing as a form of creativity, self-satisfaction and inspiration and feels confident designing and guiding writing exercises. I feel my own writing practice helps me when I'm designing the workshops and encouraging others as I enjoy writing poetry and short stories, and that supports my other work. Feedback from the recent workshop online revealed the different motivations for people joining these classes, and the comments shared included feeling more livened and engaged after the sessions. And another one said, working within a group enhanced my connections during these COVID times, which has been good for my sense of well-being. This was in response to a simple questionnaire developed with Solve the Care that we sent out. I love, another person said, I love the positivity of the sessions, the beautiful poetry and the writing prompts, but what I liked most was seeing, seeing smiling faces every Wednesday afternoon. And another said, I felt relaxed and in a good mood afterwards. If I'd had a particularly busy day, it made me feel refreshed. Some of the people involved in this pilot uh, were coming from work, which is why we chose in an early evening. Others had you know, the normal challenges of working from home. When I say coming from work, they literally were in effect key workers who had gone somewhere to work and were coming back to join the workshop. Um, others obviously had childcare responsibilities and demands. So it was a real mix and it was a mix of ages. Um, and not all from Solver, although quite a few were from Solver, because obviously we helped to promote it with Solver Care. I just wanted to, to conclude, I wanted to say pre-lockdown, many writing for wellbeing workshops were offered in person, but they do also work well online. And that's obviously for those who can access and use Zoom. There are pros and cons for each way of running the workshops, neither is better as it depends on individuals' needs and preferences. Writing for wellbeing workshops can take place in libraries, community spaces, and outside in nature, if the weather allows, which is what I like to do. Practitioners come from a variety of backgrounds, including teaching, healthcare, social care, and like myself, therapies. 
However, any practitioner should have had training and experience of safeguarding and group work. I'm looking forward to running some further workshops outdoors in my local area and perhaps another online course in the winter months. If you'd like to know more about this, you can contact me, but I hope this has given you a sense of the pleasure of writing for well-being. And to finish, I'll leave you with the words of one of my favorite writers, the American Joan Didion. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see and what it means. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that. Um, really, like genuinely heartlifting, I think, to hear about the workshops and uh, that kind of offering time and space to explore sort of expressive and playful writing can, uh, can bring about so many of the changes that Maria alluded to. I think just to say both, um, both great presentations, I confess to anecdotally already knowing quite a lot about both of them, generally along the lines of, I love the writing, I was really surprised, or the mosaics kind of has got a, has got a, a tomb to it in the, in the village, so it's, it's wonderful. Um, are there any questions from the from the floor? I think there are lots of themes there that came through, sort of space for contemplation, to ease stress and anxiety, build confidence, um, sense of happiness, creativity, new connections, lots to think about. Are there any questions? And I'll have a look for hands. If you'd like to put questions in the chat, you're also very welcome to do that. Or any thoughts, reflections? I'd love it if somebody had a question. Mike Hotson and then Sue Denman, fantastic. Mike, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much for all the work that you've done, and thank you uh, for the presentations that that uh, that have uh, uh, been presented this morning. Uh, great. Uh, I've been a, a community artist for uh, most of my life. Started when I was sixteen years old, and um, and we seem to be uh, trying to justify our art forms with all kinds of research that's been done over the ages, uh, with all kinds of theories, with all kinds of tagging this on and tagging that on. And now especially it's just uh, come to a head because of the, the uh, rich pickings that we can get uh, within the health service network, because we all know that the community arts our creativity is very, very good for uh, all kinds of different individuals at different times in their life. Um, so I'm just wondering why we have to feel the need to justify our existence and our art forms using other people's language and understanding. Would anybody like to answer that, either the presenters? Or is there anybody else who'd like to speak to that point? I'm sure we all have lots of thoughts about that. Sue Denman, would you like to respond? I, I think that Mike has gone to the heart of um, really the way in which not just the arts in the community, but other forms of community development have to justify themselves. I do feel that there's a wind of change coming. I mean, evaluation isn't simply for funders and for the public sector. It is also to reflect internally, you know, have things worked? Have people enjoyed it? Would they rather do something different? Is this worth pursuing? You know, so not all, you know, research and evaluation are to do with feeding the beast. So that's the, the first point I would like to make. But the reality is that in a um, strapped cash environment, we will have to justify what we do. And the challenge is not so much in agreeing to evaluate with other people's metrics, but to convince other organizations that they should take a holistic view of well-being, even if their contribution is to curative medicine or to look after people who need you know, care at various points in their lives, they should still have a commitment to community development and you know, which includes of course the arts. So my, I suppose what the conclusion I'm coming to in this ramble is that to a certain extent, we have to play the game and that game should be about pushing organization to value prevention 
you know, and evaluation is one form of, of, of opening the door to that, you know. I, I agree with Mike, it sends us batty, you know, having to play the metrics of other organisations, but it, you know, it, it can work in our favour, at least in opening discussions. Okay, thank you. Very can, I, can I add something to that? I agree with Mike's question. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, Nick Andrews, he'd like to come in. Yes, please, Amanda. Sorry. Um, yes, Mike, I think that's a great question. Uh, and I, I definitely uh, feel the same as you. Um, but I do think that this is where the value uh, of an organization like to, Together for Change comes. That I would hope that as a freelancer and practitioner, I don't have to keep uh, proving and finding the research and finding the evidence because as, a, as an organization, they are collecting the research and the data and helping to make and present the case. Uh, so I see that as a benefit personally. What I do object to is constantly being asked to re-explain the benefits of the arts. I agree on that. Okay, thank you, Amanda. I've got Nick Andrews and then Barbara Bale. Nick. It's only quickly because I do share with Mike's um, sentiment really it's like um in mental health if, if, if you've got a mental health problem you stroke a dog it becomes pet therapy most people just stroke a dog because it's a nice thing to, so we therapize everything don't we and and actually there's so much that the, the and what happens is I think statutory services I, i'm talking particularly from social services perspective have become very over professionalized really and we've developed a whole language and framework the way we engage with people which is dehumanizing really and um isn't based on relationships and humanity so i think it's a really important lesson okay we have to enter into the into the world and of health but health need to learn a new language really and i know like mental health they've got this work around open dialogue which isn't therapy and mental health it's around creating creative safe spaces for people to to open themselves so anyway i just i just think there's this is such a rich um yeah we have to tune into the health language but health needs to tune into the humanity language don't they we do. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to ask Barbara Bale to um, say something and then we're going to break for um, five minutes so that we can all go and get cups of tea, coffee um, and come back in time for the breakout room. So Barbara and then we'll break. Fancy giving me the last word, Jesse. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> no, dangerous. Um, I, I, I just wanted to, to say, I mean, a lot of the people on, on the, the screen are involved in the arts. So obviously you, you, you sort of, when you're involved in it, you see the benefit of it and you think, why should I have to justify it? Now, I was brought up in Liverpool and arts, anything called arts and culture was not for me because people from, <laughs> from Liverpool just didn't see it as theirs. Um, so anything like the programmes, and I'm now in Solver, um, and, and then I went to central London, and, and similarly, I think there's a lot of perhaps generation, and maybe that's changing because my daughter's the absolute opposite, um, think it's not for them. It's for people who are retired. You know, that's all very nice with your, you know, your twin set and your pearls. You can go and do your mosaics and whatever else you want to do. But actually, in the real world, I'm more bothered about, you know, how I feed the kids sort of thing. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't think people really appreciate the breadth of what we now understand or the people around perhaps would promote as arts. So it's not nothing about justifying it. It's about just making people realise that just you know, being part of something is good for them and it's for everyone and it's not for the, the chosen privileged. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, that's, that's the last that's word. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's going to be lots more opportunities for last words throughout the rest of the morning. Um, it's a good message to lead us into a, into a, a short break um, in order to be able to, you know, go and get a cup of tea or coffee and then come back quite sharply at 10.40 if you would, um, but we'll, we'll wait on for another minute. If anyone would like to stay and chat, I'll be here. See you very shortly, bye-bye.
Hi, Sandra. A question. We, we can't hear you, Sandra. I came in at the end of the of the of the session, but I am interested, very interested in this because what Solver Care has done for me and a lot of people is make contacts. And via the contacts, we have made relationships, we meet people, and we have actually I went to see somebody the other day because she wanted to talk about her visit with a family to uh, Folly Farm. So there you have it. You have the stories coming out, you have the contacts, and you have the warm and inviting family unit. And that's happening quite a lot with us. And, and Solver Care stimulated all this. And I just... Yeah, indeed, what... indeed. I mean, is, is it... Yeah, perhaps that's something that will appear later on in the conversation. Sorry. Yeah, OK. No, no, it's, 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 it's good. Just... Right. I'm just wondering if I'm it was relevant. To... Was it, is it relevant to what you're talking about? That, that community, that uh, relating to one another, that stories coming around. It is, it's, it's the art. I think, yeah, I think it is, yes. I think, I think it is. I think so. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Okay. Thank you, Jess. Well, 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 all right. Lovely. Good to see you here. Thank Thanks you. For coming. <laughs>a classroom with people not in the you know a classroom environment like school just gave everybody the confidence to think oh well, you know I've done a six-week course in this I'm going to do another course I'm going to do yeah. the next course that comes along and most of them were arts based and the only sad thing about springboard is it did because it had to justify its funding and everything it had to reinvent itself it had to you know become something else and it went down then the more academic routes courses mm -hmm. things less of the arts and creative you know hooking people in with the arts and creative sort of things but that was the sad thing really was that but the ultimate outcome of it was that you know lots and lots of people got jobs from the fact that they went along to a small little craft club and initially you know took that chance and was encouraged to go along to a little art club or something lots of people went on to get full-time work and were able to support their families for the first time it was just phenomenal phenomenal thing and of course springboard continues in Pembrokeshire so you know it has got a legacy but lots of people went on to do degrees they've done degrees in Swans University you know from the Moncton area so it's really nice to think that something so simple as an arts and crafts class mm -hmm. a lot of people can be completely life-changing had, had such a long legacy it's wonderful yeah. Yeah. thank you that's that's a great that's great sort of to hear about and lovely to have that in the break and that sort of example and those light bulb moments that can mm. lead to other things. So thank you for that. I okay. believe we've got everybody back. Um, and um, so lots of things happening in the in the chat. And um, please keep the questions and comments coming and I'll and I'll pick things up. So if there's a question that wasn't answered earlier, uh, we'll try to get that in at a later stage, hopefully. Um, Amy has very brilliantly set up some breakout rooms and you're going to be put into some groups just press accept. There are two questions we'd like you to discuss with the help of a chair and a scribe who'll be taking notes. 
And the two questions are, how have you experienced positive effects on you or your community's well-being as a result of the arts? And how could the arts be promoted and encouraged in Pembrokeshire? Um, I want to thank the chairs and scribes for agreeing to support with this. Um, and Amy will now create the breakout rooms. Thanks very much, Amy. See you shortly. Um, are you okay? Okay, how are we doing? Okay, I think there's some are these, people these people all allocated. Yeah. Yeah, so we're just waiting to put them into Presumably they're still on a break, in which case. Yeah, it's just you that hasn't been assigned. Okay. Hi, Cara. No apologies. Where am I going? <laughs> Amy will help you right now. Not a um, worry. In room three, it should say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, Cara. Um, well, that was good. I think I think we'll just support everyone to get into the breakout rooms. Yeah, um, might be some technical issues we can sort out. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah, it's just we could um, we could pause the recording now briefly. Hello, welcome back, Kreuz on all. Welcome back, is that everyone? Fantastic, I hope there were some good colourful conversations um, and those two questions were explored thoroughly and there was an opportunity to round up at the end. Quite often there's not and conversations are mid-flow, I've discovered. So I hope the chairs were nice and strict and the scribes were writing furiously. I so think it's the like the, the closest we come to time travel, suddenly being sucked from a breakout group back to the main <laughs> meeting. So uh, I always have an experience of a Star Trek. Right? <laughs> Excellent. That's what we like to hear, Guy. New experiences every day. Um, so the first group I have was um, Amanda and Ian. So I'd like Ian to feedback, please. Ian. We, we can't hear you, Ian, at the moment. No. no. Jesse, he's just upstairs. Hi. He can come down. So why don't you move on to the next group and then Ian will come and use my connection. OK, fine. So uh, rather than you, Maria, we'll then go straight to Abby, if that's OK. Um, leaping to group three. Abby, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. How's your connection? Are you right. still out in the star in the universe somewhere? Are you here? Yes, I haven't been beamed up, Scotty. Good. Okay, right. <laughs> Over to you. Um, uh, lots of things came up. Um, everything we mentioned, kind of fun, joyful, things being cool, attractive came up. For the first question, some of the main themes was that people don't always realize they're taking part in an arts type activity when they're taking part in something um, and that people take from it their own things in their own way. Some people might go to it for the social side of things. Some people might prefer to do something from home and yet still feel connected and still feel like they're giving something or receiving. Um, we talked about finding different ways to explore our surroundings. We had an example of um, in lockdown about scarecrows being used for activities in the village, finding new ways to communicate with each other and how arts can help with that uh, on different scales. And that the impact of the impact the arts has on us and our communities is vast. Um, we had an example where we had it broken down to three ways. So it's the sense of purpose that facilitators and those putting things on and organizing things receive. And then the people who take part in the events take something from it, what they get from it. And then the wider effect on the community 
um, and adding into the kind of regeneration of that community in that area. So for how the arts could be promoted in Pembrokeshire, um, we spoke about how the pandemic has highlighted the benefit of the arts and how do we keep this interest? How do we keep people involved? We thought, felt it was important to get people excited and to know what they want and how the best, the best way to engage with them and look at what we can provide, look at where we can work with partners, perhaps sharing spaces, um, outdoor spaces to put on events. Um, and yeah, we ended with a nice quote uh, of uh, support the arts before we lose it. Support the arts before we lose it. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Abby. Thanks, Catherine, for that. Um, we've got about sort of five minutes left if I'm going to be really strict with time. So for the, for the next um, scribes, if you could um, offer sort of something kind of fresh reflections rather than perhaps repeating what Abby said, that'd be brilliant for the timekeeping. Um, and I think we'll go next to um, Sue and Gwyneth's group. So I've got Gwyneth, would you be happy to go next? And then we'll go Maria and then Ian. Yes, I'll condense the conversation, which was very jam-packed. Um, <laughs> the answers to the first questions, which is about the positive effects, we thought the, the feeling of connectedness within communities, bringing the community together, artists, freelance workers and communities, um, a big discussion we had on freelance workers and the effect of COVID, um, many freelancers do not have the time and ability to fill in application forms. So there was a big discussion on funding, um, which leads us into the second question, which is about how could the arts be promoted and encouraged? And I think there needed to be um, some rebuilding after COVID now. So a recognition that arts and therapies is going to be very much a focus and, and should be a focus for the health um, and for Welsh Government. Um, funding, goalposts keep on changing. Um, small groups are competing with large organisations. So small galleries, for instance, can compete with some of the larger organisations that have got the time and the knowledge to, to support funding applications. Um, and then we finished on a quote, which is coming out of COVID is an opportunity to bring people together joint funding applications to address the health and wellbeing agenda. Fantastic. I love these quotes that are coming through at the end. A really comprehensive view. Thank you. Um, Maria. OK, thanks, Jesse. So for the first question, we heard about um, a village choir, Village Voices in Langham, which pre-COVID had 58 members of all ages, which created an opera about World War One and won an award. Uh, we had a lovely comment about creativity to, can make people believe in themselves and that their dreams can come true, which leads on to collaboration and other things. One of our group talked about when she was teaching and bringing in cultural stimuli into lessons made it a difference to people's, people's motivation to learn. And uh, also about some Zoom sessions that started just before the pandemic with adults with disabil learning disabilities. Um, it allowed them to develop their confidence and show their own styles. And then for the second question, mm -hmm. we, did, we didn't have much time for this, so we've got bullet points. So we think more publicity and promotion. We should be funding original ideas, better partnership working, reaching out to communities and to do more diverse projects. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Maria. Some great kind of opportunities there to think about. Um, and Ian, if you're happy to go next, that would be great. Yeah. Um, to begin with, in our group, it was acknowledged that um, there is an issue about arts. If people are, are approached and asked, what is it you need? They will not tend to answer, oh, I need a choir or I need art or I need literature. Um, they will go for more, more sort of basic fundamental things. So it, it's very important to, to get art in there. This is something that probably starts at school. It was discussed where you're pushed into you are arts or you are a science person. Maria and I probably can both testify to that because something very weird happens to you when you're good at both and you get shoved into architecture, which everybody thinks is a catch-all um, thing. So it was commented that really what's needed is uh, an open approach. Um, 
to get people in a welcoming approach. It mustn't be a, a cliquey situation and you really need to get if it's intergenerational workshops or other things to connect people, you need people who, are, who participate who are good at promoting things that gives the snowball effect. And the arts, we saw our quote was they need to be normalized into the mainstream, I suppose, as well being seen as being some kind of expensive alternative therapy. So in terms of how the arts could be promoted, really it would simply be that, I think, um, that people need to be encouraged to participate in things they never thought they would do before. Uh, it, the people who don't consider themselves artistic. Um, and uh, I think it was Liz who mentioned this can really open things up to, you know, almost everyone in the community, what the point is to welcome people in and uh, to make them feel that they're part of the endeavor, not uh, that it's not a cliquey, uh, closed off area for them. Okay, wonderful. I think that sentiment of being part of the endeavour is something that I certainly feel I'd like to share in. So we'll move on. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, contributing to all those breakout rooms and some kind of fantastic things coming through. The second part now, a, we have um, Catherine Lambert from Span Arts, and we also have um, Sue Davis um, of Pembrokeshire Inspired. So I'd like to invite Catherine Lambert, firstly, um, to talk about, she's going to talk about a couple of key projects that illustrate the value of the arts and well-being. So Catherine, if you'd like to start, please. Thank you, Jesse. I'm going to be sharing my screen. I've got a PowerPoint, but I'm going to dip in and out because I want to show a couple of film clips as well, if I can. Um, so I'll just bring it up. Can you see the Great. PowerPoint? We right. can. You get it on slideshow. Hmm. It's going to do that thing where it's on the early on. Can you see I that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm Catherine Lambert. I'm the director of SPAN. We're a community arts organisation based in Pembrokeshire. Um, um, we we have our um, have office premises in Narbeth, but actually we haven't worked from those premises over the last year, but we do work across the whole of Pembrokeshire in different venues and settings and we've been bringing the arts to Pembrokeshire uh, for the last 30 years. We're um, driven by the core belief that the arts have the power to improve people's lives in Pembrokeshire, to improve lives and well-beings in a number of ways, and we have a kind of new mission really to create art that has the potential to create positive social change in the county and we do this through um, kind of three ways of working. Um, the first is very much around provision of uh, live events and activities and that can take the shape of gigs, music, events, theatre, big public realm, carnivals, lantern parades and all of those sorts of things that um, we unfortunately we haven't been doing in the last year. And also, um, we also run a, a large number of community arts projects um, through which we're funded to, um, predominantly to deliver work that has a positive impact on well-being. So arts and health work, well-being projects, heritage project, placemaking, skills develop, and all those things that Jesse so um, clearly put at the beginning of the introduction. And we also run a very well-established volunteering in the arts program, um, which has, has been very successful in trying to open up access um, and inclusion to, to, to as many different people as possible. Um, as I said, the, the kind of, we have a, a vision really to create and make and create access to art that has positive social change in, in Pembrokeshire. And we do that by trying to inspire and connect rural people, places and communities creatively. Um, and in brief, really, we have a number of, try and achieve this through a number of aims, which is around energizing a healthier, happier society, bringing communities together to enjoy those collective shared experiences and reducing the barriers to access to the arts and innovative ideas really um, for rural people in places. Um, 
And we've already this morning touched on all the vast number of ways really that the arts can have a positive impact on, on people and a place. And I want to just this morning, I'm gonna mention just a couple of uh, examples of either fairly recent or current projects and new work that we've been, that we're working on that um, are very much focused on trying to improve health and well-being in Pembrokeshire, encouraging quality of life, and all of these really important things that we think and believe and strongly believe at SPAN that the arts have the power to, to contribute to. Um, the first project I wanted to mention was a project called Remote Choir, um, which was a project that we developed before COVID, before lock, uh, lockdown, but it was still very much um, around connecting very uh, rurally isolated, often older, lonely and housebound individuals from across rural parts of Pembrokeshire to come together and connect using technology really to um, work with filmmaker and um, uh, singer songwriter to create and write and collaborate to create a shared um, song and choir essentially from different parts of the county and this was a kind of really important project for us that's unlocked lots of other future ideas and we worked with people who um, as I say were either housebound and had a range of health conditions and there is and I'm not going to show you this film but if you go to our website or our YouTube channel there's a number of films and this is a really powerful film um, where we created a case study around the success and impact of this experience on those who've taken part where people have told us you know about that life-changing experience it's really important and positive and the the that we used a number of developed a number of case studies and also used a number of evaluation methodologies and well-being scales to assess and understand the impact that it had on those who've taken part and broadly speaking it was um you know very positive huge um positive impact and increase in well-being from those taking part um as as part of that um we have got a wide range really of singing projects that we've been running over the years um and many of those we have been able to continue throughout the lockdown, albeit in a virtual way. And I wanted to just show you a quick clip really um, of a um, Korpaug has been a mass community choir that come together and have performed and written songs together, built from a numbers of community groups, often about 90 people, members of the community of all ages, intergenerational, coming together to sing um, over the last number of years, about five years, we've been running this project, but most recently um, as part of the real kind of interest in sea shanty singing and the, uh, the sea shanty singing craze that has taken place online over the last year. And we did um, a nice little clip here for you of um, what this particular group have been able to do. So I'm, if I share this, can you see this piece of footage? Yeah, so I'll just give you um, a little bit of this. I think if you stop your screen share on the PowerPoint, Catherine, we'll we'll get to see the okay. we'll get to see the. If you stop that one, it'd be lovely to see the see the. Um, Can you see that with some sea shanty singers? Not quite yet. Hmm. We we'd love to though. <laughs> Um, if not failing that today, we can we can put links to all this through through the Together for Change website. Ah, oh, there we Got go. It. There we are. That's it. Well done. In the horizon, keep your spirit high, take it one day at a time. Beauty on your doorstep, kindness in the village. Keep your spirit high, take it one day at a time. Notice the world, care for yourself, the joy that we find in love. Walk down, stay present, stay kind, stay connected, the joy that we find in love. Down, pull in 
together, shopping for each other. Keep your spirit high, take it one day at a time. Good relations are starting, fountains on the water. Keep your spirit high, take it one day at a time. I'm going <laughs> to just cut them in their prime because there's a few things I wanted to show you. Um, and I'll just share my screen again back to the PowerPoint. I have made it quite complicated. <laughs> that was wonderful. We don't mind the, the jumping. OK, so hopefully you can see the PowerPoint again. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so there you're here now. Um, then I also wanted to actually tell you a little bit about um, a project that we've been running as well called Theatre Sofa that we've run over the course of the last um, 12 months, which is a new online community theatre uh, company presenting live stream community performances through Zoom in both English and Welsh. And so it's been a creative way to connect rurally isolated and housebound individuals over the last year. We've had five live stream community performances. And again, I do really want to show you in particular, this is the last switch about I'm going to do, but um, a little clip of um, a 30 second clip of this particular um, bit of footage because I'm having to go from one thing to another. Can you see that? Yeah. We can have your year, Captain. We don't do not sure. You never see them go the answer scare. Wittening of your e, Captain, a true war for win, man, and war. Sucher bell bister, a lad of office. A bingle of the glyph, still, curling fever, to eat of a china tea to go green to a guy. So I just feel like, unless you see it, you don't really know what we mean. <laughs> Um, and also, uh, it's a really great example. We've done English productions, Welsh productions. We've brought um, groups of about 20 members of the commun community cast together to create those performances. And they've all been, you know, on uh, at, in their own home um, creating those performances. And we've had phenomenal um, feedback about those experiences, about how... Hello, I hope we're live. Oh. I haven't stopped it. That's a bit of one. No. So hopefully you can see this. Um, yeah, people have. There's been a huge bond uh, of people coming together to um, have that experience. Can you see the pr presentation again, Jesse? I can see it. Yeah. Just to say, you've got a couple of minutes left, Catherine. Okay. Okay. Well, if that's the case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go. I'm not going to mention all of these projects, but I we are going to be showing Shared Worlds film at the end of this morning, which is another really great example that can say better than I can about the success and impact some of the work we've been doing over the last year. What I did want to mention, though, is that, you know, through a huge amount of um, storytelling, data gathering, feedback, evaluation, and so on. And we are, as is much of the art sector, become, being able to better and better tell the story of the impact of the arts. And we are trying to do that in a way that others understand, but we are still really suffering. Um, I wanted to mention that, you know, we've lost a third of our income over the last year. We, our turnover has reduced, we've lost, um, we're losing staff, we don't have core funding for the work that we do. So although there's a positive story about the impact of our work, um, there is a, you know, we, there is a crisis really, because there is a, a recognition that this work's important. And I wanted to, to mention in particular that um, 
I'm just going to go all the way to that point. You know, what, what, what does the future look like? What are the next steps? Um, despite the good work in this area, this ever-growing body of evidence, um, we do have an insecure future. Um, we're about to start a consultation to take, um, take people's input and views for that. And also, um, we do have a new arts and health and wellbeing network for Pembrokeshire. Um, which we've been running since pre-COVID times, and um, I would be happy to share the link and people to get in touch if they want to learn out a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to stop there, Jesse, because I didn't really get to cover everything. I spent too much time flicking about. It's absolutely not a problem. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for adhering to the, the time restrictions that are being imposed. Um, really tremendous, lots of enthusiastic comments in the chat, and I wish we were all staying on the all the staying all staying on at the end to sing, sea shanties. Um, so thanks, thanks so much. Um, all the presentations will be on the Together for Change website. So if anybody would like to look in more detail at um, any of that text, they're very welcome to do so. And our final speaker today, I'm really happy to introduce Sue Davis from Espadoli Sivembo, Pembrokeshire Inspired, uh, which was a leader funded cultural project commissioned by Adwine Sivembo. And Sue is going to talk to us about this. So over to you, Sue. I believe Amy's doing your screen share for you. There we go. Jochen Bauer, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for that. That was wonderful. Um, uh, and um, I, Amy is helping me here because uh, my um, own uh, internet connection is a bit unstable. So I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, um, Hello, my name's Sue Davis. I'm uh, a cultural freelancer operating here in Pembrokeshire. Uh, and um, the remit for Aspridoli Sea Benfro, Pembrokeshire inspired, um, is, as just been stated, um, has come from leader funding. Um, uh, could you turn the, the screen? Um, uh, thank you. And there are three key project outputs for this project, um, which are to deliver a, a strong, cohesive cultural network, which is sustainable, sustainable online arts portal, which is a one-stop shop for the cultural sector and information for the general public, a grassroots inspired sustainable cultural strategy drawing on best arts practice. Could you, uh, um, next slide, please. The leader principles um, are to contribute to a competitive, productive, sustainable economy, encouraging entrepreneurship, utilizing local skills, um, improving provision of transport and accessibility, exploring new models of service delivery, participating, collaborating and innovating. Next slide, please. A little bit of background here, which, which, Kath, which Catherine also alluded to. Um, Throughout the years um, uh, that I've been um, uh, involved with Pembrokeshire, I have visited the eclectic and wonderful arts offer um, here. And um, it's very much um, driven by the geography of the county as well as the spirit and the essence of the county. Um, and um, within that, um, of course, uh, we, we have to take note of the fact that um, clearly there's a capacity issue. Um, we, have, due to a decade of austerity, for example, we lost the um, uh, the cultural arts officer here, and um, the capital of culture bid for St David's in the last few years um, didn't happen in the end. But but what we did see from that, I think, was that there was a spirit of um, great interest and partnership potential um, in the county based on um, the bringing together um, and the teamwork and the interest um, in uh, a bit of that nature. And of course, we've leaving, you know, at the very center of all of this is also 
the essence and the spirit and the culture of the county. Um, and in essence, it's very independent, um, spirited, bilingual, um, and um, uh, um, that um, and, and, and basically um, what we see in the county is this great inspiration drawing from the landscape and the culture. Um, and, uh, and also what we see, I think, is the need for effective resource management um, in terms of um, the strategic steer that we need for the arts. So, um, uh, drawing on all of that, can I have the next slide, please? Where are we with this project? Well, if we take that leader principle of participation and collaboration, um, this project um, seeks to really root out the creativity in the county, nurture it, find out what aspects of the arts and culture offer the community uses, can access, um, and um, in, in those terms, um, exactly where we need to move forward strategically um, as a county. So with this in mind, um, the um, cultural powers that be in, in the county um, decided that um, some money would, uh, would be found to actually try to explore ways in which we could work better together as a sector. And so um, within that, we advertised for a cultural core team and we had an application process two years ago. Uh, you and Thomas from Planet very kindly um, uh, was involved with us for that. So next slide, please. Um, and then, so where, where are we now within this journey? Well, in terms of developing that network, um, we developed a core team working across most art forms to develop the beginnings and explore the beginnings of a countywide cultural infrastructure. It includes Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, the Council, Planet, the Torch Theatre, Tenby Museum and Art Gallery, Span Arts, commercial galleries, individual artists. Um, this, has, this core team has shaped the partnership vision for the project and mission and values, um, informing the grassroots cultural strategy development. The pandemic, of course, has tested our partnership, but I'm pleased to say it survived. We met uh, weekly via Zoom during the first lockdown. We moved back to a six to eight week meeting model by last autumn. Um, we have formed the nucleus of developing an IT strategy, uh, creating content for digital platforms. And um, I'm pleased to say that um, the National Park and the Council are contributing 50% of the digital maintenance costs for year one for our IT platform. And Planet is offering an employee's time one day a week to assist with content development for that. We're currently inviting arts organizations and individuals countywide to join the network as content creators. And the website membership is a, an important part of, uh, also an important part of all, all of this for wide term, long term development. Next slide, please. So, where are we now? We are, uh, we are we've, we've recruited, we've met as a core team, we've developed strategy, we've developed content. We are here um, designing and developing um, um, a digital um, offer for Pembrokeshire. Um, and we are about to embark on our evaluation um, and uh, uh, the delivery element of the project. Next slide. So we've got core and we've got core team. We had at the beginning of the project, we had core team training um, with a specialist um, consultant. Um, and that core team training was really critical um, because it helped us to um, visualize how we could get closer as uh, an arts 
partnership to our audiences. Uh, and here you can see um, what we did. We were um, working together here to um, think about audience development, to actually ask our audiences, um, well, what is it that they most value about the arts? What prevents them from taking part? And um, how would they like the arts to develop for them? And for this, we um, developed a means of engaging with the audiences that we have. And um, so, for example, we chose to have to develop a collage and we used different uh, symbols. Um, so, for example, the dolphin, the dolphins um, represented how does taking part in the arts make you feel? Rocks and boulders, for example, what are the barriers to participation? Um, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. We consulted with, with artists and um, we used focus groups. So, for example, these are some uh, slides from the St. David's focus group and the Solver focus group, um, which we discussed all aspects of the um, engaging with the arts from your perspective as artists. And I've also gone and spoken one, in many one-to-ones with um, uh, artists about their perception of um, what is missing from the arts sector in the county for them. And I've had lots of in very, in very interesting discussions on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've also had public consultations. Uh, here we're in the VC gallery um, in Hefford West uh, with storyteller Philo Quady. Um, and we are discussing with visitors and the community um, their experience of um, the arts here in Pembrokeshire and here at the county show also. Next slide, please. And again, We've got politicians involved, um, countywide. Next slide. So um, where are we with developing our grassroots inspired uh, cultural strategy? Well, over two years, we've met, we've worked with communities um, and we've asked lots of questions. Um, the consultation has highlighted that we need to, as a sector, communicate better um, offer better opportunities for children and young people in particular, support the arts sector's resilience and long-term survival much better, and develop best, best practice uh, in raising ambition countywide for the arts. Um, the core team continued to meet um, during the pandemic, honing arts, our arts strategy. Um, I've developed a Facebook presence and invited artists to post information on there about their work um, and we are embarking now on um, developing content creation and for this for the website um, and for this we really need everybody to be engaged with us as a, a successful strong strong partnership um, next slide okay about a minute and a half left Susie. yeah Okay, so we've got our grassroots um, element. We've also got um, our Welsh community element. Here we've got M Professor Mary Hopwood talking about Welsh culture at one of the core team meetings in uh, that we've had. Um, and we've um, very much talked around unifying Pembrokeshire, celebrating the differences that um, different parts of the county have, um, but very much pulling together as a partnership, a cultural partnership. Next slide. So core team values and thinking involve active partnership collaboration. I cannot stress this enough. Training in CPD, being ambitious, advocating for the arts, really, really um, developing resilience. Um, so that does involve funding, as Catherine pointed out earlier, it involves really um, sorting that out. Social justice agendas, 
the economic aspects and the cultural of Pembrokeshire, very, very important to recognise and to understand, um, and quality, and the kind of quality that we're looking at uh, needs to be of the highest nature, in, and we really need to be able to um, develop and supply that, being environmentally aware, um, and in, being inspired and um, by what is fundamentally the nature of the county. So next slide, please. We've developed we, we our strategy. Point, and lastly, can I just say this? Next slide, please. It's partnership. My key message is we need, as a sector, to vastly improve our strategic part partnership working. In all, you know, what Catherine talked about was um, the difficulty for individual freelancers in terms of in terms of capacity, um, and this is actually endemic, I think, in the sector. The that issue of capacity. We have lots and lots of diverse small small uh, organisations, arts organisations that do have capacity issues. Next slide. So we have developed all of our thinking around Pembrokeshire inspired through, through numerous meetings. Here we've got the digital meetings. The next slide. And where are we? Well, we've employed um, an IT consultant. We've now did, um, employed IT, IT developers who are local. Um, the, I, the I really IT, do need to ask you to round up soon. Sue. Okay, um, we time, are please. online to develop our platform then for June this year, the summer this year. Core team members have signed up as content creators. Um, and last slide for this online portal. But what we and we've now we're now evaluating the project. Um, so we're hoping to be able to, to um, finally launch it this summer. Um, we're hoping that um, we are going to have, uh, going to be able to bring it all together in a launch. And we will need everybody to work together on this for this summer um, and to work together on funding opportunities and um, I'm going to have to close you. Yeah, soon, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it thank there. But much. I just I want think, to say thank you. And um, that obviously we're going to be looking out to all of you to help to provide content for the website um, and for the app that we're developing. And hopefully you can help us to populate it and help us to really make it strong. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut you short. Um, we, we have to have allow time for questions, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for an interesting and inspiring presentation. Um, everything will be on the website. And if you put your email address in the chat, we'll, everybody can get in touch with you if they want to. Now, yeah. we've got two, two minutes for questions. And I recognise that comments are really appreciated and valuable, but some questions for either Catherine or Sue are there any questions? I'm going to be looking for hands, like buzzers on University Challenge. Ready? Any questions? Yes, oh, Abby's got one. Abby's got one. <laughs> Go on. Um, I was thinking about volunteers and trustees and everybody that obviously does a lot to keep um, things going. How do we attract more young people? Any How ideas? do we attract young people? Well, young people um, have got to be in my view, integral to um, the project. And um, one of the, I've tried very hard to engage young people. I've gone out to uh, youth groups. So, um, and we have got um, some youth groups working with us. So we've got the Tanyard project and we've got um, the Cardigan Youth Project. Unfortunately, I couldn't, um, the, the 
uh, the, the points project in um, Fishguard were, were too busy. Um, but those are the people that we've gone to initially. Um, and at the moment, uh, haven't really been able to engage the schools. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, Catherine, would you like to add anything to that? And then we'll have some closing words from Sue Denman. Catherine, thanks, Sue. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's quite fair to say it's been hard. It's harder to engage young people in Pembrokeshire. There are less of them, and they're. Um, but we have run and do. Um, try to work hard to ensure that within the programme, and it's been harder, I think, over the last year, our live events are where we attract more young people. Volunteers, we still continue to attract volunteers, um, although again, probably 50% of our volunteers are aged over 50. We're currently uh, running um, a arts masterclass programme for years um five and six and uh this summer and that's been totally oversubscribed already so the show says huge interest and demand um but it it does take you know um a, a particular focus a particular offer and particular opportunities that are dedicated to being right for young people okay thanks so much thank you abby for your brilliant question um, thank you both. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Sue Denman, um, who is going to offer some thoughts, reflections on the on today, on the on today, on the morning. Thank you, Sue. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jesse. I'm going to be very brief because I think it's been all said really uh, through the discussion and the presentation. I hope that you enjoyed and found useful our second uh, Together for Change uh, forum event. I, I'm sure that you agree with me that we didn't need convincing that um, the arts are really, really important to well-being and um, recovery after COVID. But um, it's great to hear some of those messages uh, reinforced. And we've heard some great examples of small local projects through to larger organisations that are coordinating and working in a, a strategic way. I think that what's come through for me is that there are some clearly some challenges in making arts looked at as core to well-being and uh, to make sure that it's funded properly and in a sustainable way. Um, I propose that we collate some of the discussion ideas that you came up with about strengthening the arts in the county. Obviously, that can be added to some of the uh, uh, work already underway. But Together for Change is in quite a strong position to influence change because we have um, the major public uh, sector organisations have signed up to a 10 point plan that is to do with a localised view of well-being and supporting those projects that will foster well-being. So we'd like to use our, our position to um, uh, forward the collated ideas from you to the various organisations um, who have the who hold the purse strings. So what I'd like to finish off with really is to thank everybody who's inputted into this morning, our presenters, the chairs of the breakout rooms and the scribes, and also the Together for Change team who've worked really hard to put this on. Uh, Jesse, who's also chaired so ably, and Amy and Maria. And to thank you all for coming and making this morning. I'm a, I'm a scientist and I'm trying to get more and more involved in the arts as a community member, but I found it fascinating, enjoyable, and um, quite honestly, uplifting about the future. So thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoy the film that we are finishing off with that I think Catherine is putting on. Thank you again. Thank you.